God is with us. And the people said, here we find new life. Amen. And amen to that beautiful start to worship this morning. I am Pastor George Harris, joined by my beloved colleague, Reverend Kevin Weichel, or Rev Kev. At this time of year, um, we can't always count on being in worship together because we're both taking advantage of the season, as so many do. And, um, but it's always a thrill and a delight to be together in worship. Also joined this morning by uh, the return of Brian Pia on piano. Uh, welcome back, Brian. It's uh, great to see you. Always delighted to have Jim Marchio, uh, Mar Martoccio, excuse me, um, in, in worship. That was just a, a beautiful way to start. Our music minister, Mark Mercier, is um, away this weekend living his rock star dream. So we, uh, we were all very jealous of that, but um, uh, thrilled for all of you who are worshiping in person this morning. Thrilled. All of you who weathered the storm uh, and those who thought better of it and are worshiping at home, I uh, greet you all very warmly this morning. We are a United Church of Christ. That's our denomination. If you're not quite sure what that entails, you can Google ucc.org uh, or go to our own website for some information about that. We're what is known as an open and affirming congregation, meaning that we seek to be intentional in our welcome of all people, regardless of race or ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, ability or disability. And uh, that means we seek to see each and every one of you exactly as the magnificent creation that God created you to be. Those are words and that's a commitment that we seek to live into each and every day. So, um, all joking about the weather aside, I'm told there's a tornado watch um, in all of Connecticut, so I do urge you all to be safe out there today. The bears have returned to our trees out there in the parking lot. A uh, uh, couple little cubs all the way up at the very top, so if after worship you're curious, Ardell would point those out to you. So, uh, bears and tornadoes, oh my. Um, Oh my, oh my is right. So again, welcome. Let us be together in prayer. Eternal God, companion of all who seek you and seeker of all who turn away from you, draw near to us that we may draw near to you and grant us the grace to love and to serve you that we may find in your will our true freedom through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we share these words in our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless his name.
know our foolishness, our hurtful words, the rejection we offer to others. We think God wants nothing to do with us, but in Jesus, God holds our hand and never lets go. As we journey through life with grace and forgiveness, let us pray together our unison prayer of confession, saying, Eternal God, whose word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, we recognize and confess that we have failed to respond fully to your gracious presence in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, you have offered us new life, fulfillment, and freedom to serve you. We confess that we are captive to our own ways of doing things and hold fast to our opinions and habits. The wrong we do is made worse by the good we leave undone. Reconcile us to you and to all people. God of mercy, forgive us all our sin and strengthen us anew for life as you intend. God promises us life, hope, forgiveness, grace, and God never goes back on any promises. This is the good news. Thanks be to God who never gives up on us, but whose love is always wrapped around us. Amen.
That's what you call a deep bench. When Mark Mercier is away, we miss him very dearly, but um, at the same time, we have the blessing of Brian and Jim, so thank you both. That was beautiful. Amen. Um, before I turn to the scripture passage, I just want to um, say a word. You may have noticed that I um, adjusted some of the pronouns in the call to worship um, from Psalm 100, just to uh, be a little more inclusive. And that call to worship, as does this scripture passage, includes the word Lord. And I've heard different uh, responses from people over the years about that word. Some people find it deeply meaningful, um, and others either find it to be a word that is just difficult to relate to today because we don't really have lords in our lives today, and some find it really challenging. And I just um, came across something from a colleague this week that just will forever impact the way I hear and understand that word lord. Um, the English word lord comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for loaf provider. What a lovely metaphor for God, particularly in the context of communion with its memories of all the ways in which God provides bread, literal and figurative. So Lord, loaf provider. Isn't that beautiful? So hear these words from the 25th chapter of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padanaram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body was like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate. May God bless these words.
Jesus says, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? Meaning, why do we criticize the behavior, the sins of other people while ignoring our own? Well, the answer, Jesus, is that it is much easier to recognize and respond to our neighbor's sins than our own. I recently watched the classic 1950 Japanese film, complete with subtitles, Rashomon, written and directed by the acclaimed Akira Kurosawa. Named among the best films ever made, it tells a story of the murder of a samurai and the assault of his wife in a forest. What makes the film unique is that it tells the story from four different perspectives. Kurosawa uses this device so brilliantly that it is now known as the Kurosawa effect and has been used in films from Pulp Fiction to Gone Girl. In Rashomon, a priest and a woodsman take shelter from a storm in the ruins of a temple and revive and review the events of the past days. A commoner also arrives, so the priest and woodsman tell him the story of what has just transpired at the courthouse. Four people testify. The woodsman, who discovered the samurai's body, a notorious bandit charged with the murder, the samurai's wife, and the samurai himself through a medium because he's dead. Each account couldn't be more different. After one point of relating the stories told by the bandit and the woman, the woodsman said, it's a lie. The bandit and the woman's story is a lie. The commoner responds, it is human to lie. Most of the time, we can't be honest with ourselves. There it is, unable to see the log in our own eye. This line made me think both about the movie and my own life. Kurosawa never does reveal a true version of the event Hmm. That's the choice. It's a little muggy in here, but the choice is that we, 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 we have that um, howl in our ears. So uh, thank you. So Kurosawa never does reveal a true version of the events that transpired in the forest. It's not what the movie is about. I didn't get that the four get the sense that the four witnesses are deliberately fabricating their story to serve their own interests, but rather that their remembrances come from a failure to be honest with themselves, a failure to see the log in their own eye. Each without intention to deceive tells the story in a way that presents them in the best light. Even the bandit, who is a violent, awful man, makes it clear that he feels completely justified in his actions. The priest interjects, it is because men are weak that they lie, even to themselves. I take that to mean that us humans have a difficult time facing our scary experiences and the consequences of our actions, so we shape the way we tell our stories accordingly. I know that has been true for me. When I was a kid, I bullied, my brother Steve, for a period of time. I am almost three years older than him, and in hindsight, I'm well aware that I was a jerk. My mom and dad worked, so Steve and I were home alone after school. Steve would call mom at work to tell her that I was picking on him, and I would say, but mom, he's so annoying, he's playing with my stuff, as if this justified my behavior. In my mind at the time, what I was doing to Steve wasn't wrong. He deserved it. It was his fault. More recently, there have been big disagreements that my wife, Lourdes, and I have had where I was just insistent that I was right and she was wrong. Now, these aren't differences about what color carpet to buy, but big differences about parenting 
Only after years of calling out the speck in her eye did I, with the help of some good therapy, finally see the log in my own and acknowledge the way I contributed to our conflict. After hearing the story of the samurai as told in court through the medium, the commoner at the temple again offers his dark view of humanity to the priest. Is there anyone who is really good? Maybe goodness is just make-believe. Man just wants to forget the bad stuff and believe in the good made up stuff. It's easier that way. So I don't think we would in any way agree with that observation of the commoner, but I wonder how many of us fundamentally challenge what we believe and do on a regular basis versus just going about assuming we are right. Finally, after the version told by each of the four witnesses have been shared with the commoner, the woodsman confesses that he was not honest in his own testimony. More than just finding the body, he watched the whole murderous event. After telling the priest and the commoner what he had seen, he says to the commoner with disgust, everyone is selfish and dishonest, making excuses, the bandit, the woman, the man, and you, he says to the commoner. But the commoner had seen through the woodsman and had realized that the woodsman had still not told the whole truth about his role that day, that the woodsman had stolen a valuable dagger that had been referenced by each of the witnesses. None of the four participants was capable of relating a completely honest account of what actually happened. So I went back and watched Rashomon when I read this story of Jacob and Esau. So let's review our early biblical history. Abraham is the patriarch of the Hebrew people. God calls Abraham to leave the land of his birth and his kin there and travel to the land of Canaan, the land that God has prepared for him and his descendants. Abraham follows God's call and God says, to your offspring I will give this land. Sarah, Abraham's wife Sarah, gives birth to Abraham's heir, Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah, and here in this morning's passage, Rebekah gives birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. Even in Rebekah's womb, the boys are fighting. Esau, the firstborn, is described as red and hairy, while younger brother Jacob comes out gripping Esau's ankle as if the two had been wrestling to be born first. As the firstborn, according to ancient Jewish law, Esau would be entitled to two-thirds of the inheritance from Isaac. This would be his birthright, while Jacob would get one-third. Two times Jacob connives to cheat Esau, first out of his birthright, then out of a blessing from his father Isaac. In this morning's story, Jacob manipulates Esau to give up his birthright, that two-thirds of his inheritance. Esau is a man of the open country, a hunter, a man of strong appetites and hot temper. He is perhaps not the sharpest pencil in the drawer. When he is hungry, he thinks of nothing but his stomach. After hunting all day, he comes upon Jacob and his bubbling pot of lentil stew and says in very rough Hebrew, let me gobble up some of this red, red stuff for I am starving. Jacob seizes the opportunity and takes what is not his. Later, as told in chapter 27, Jacob tri tricks his father Isaac, who is now old and blind, to give, I to give Jacob the blessing that is meant for Esau. So he tricks his father Isaac to give him the blessing that was meant for Esau. Jacob's shenanigans continue when he manipulates his father-in-law Laban to extract unearned benefit from Laban's kindness. Jacob manipulates and lies in order to steal his brother's birthright and blessing and to enrich himself. These stories in Genesis are told by an unidentified narrator, but wouldn't it be interesting to write Jacob's story using the Rashomon effect? retelling the story first from Jacob's perspective, then Esau's, followed by Rebekah and Isaac. 
what else might we learn, not just about the events themselves, but by the people involved. So, to say the least, Jacob is a morally ambiguous character, though it appears that he is a rogue, a scoundrel, and a ne'er-do-well, he is ultimately God's rogue, scoundrel, and ne'er-do-well, ever desiring and ultimately receiving God's blessing. Later still in the story, both Jacob and Esau have gone their separate ways. They both have prospered. And Jacob travels to reconcile with his brother. Jacob stops for the night, very nervous at the reception he will receive, and in that place encounters a stranger with whom he wrestles through the whole night until daybreak. Jacob refuses to let the man go until he gives Jacob a blessing. The stranger first asks Jacob's name, then on the spot renames Jacob Israel meaning in Hebrew, the one who strives with God. Jacob's eyes are open to recognize that he has been wrestling with God, and God spares him and blesses him, giving him the name that will become the name of the nation. Jacob couldn't be more sincere, more intent about receiving God's blessing, though his methods throughout his lifetime are dubious at best. Not exactly a villain, but not a typical hero either. I am convinced that Jacob in each of these instances believes himself to be justified in talking Esau out of his birthright and his father Isaac into giving him Esau's blessing, just like I was convinced I was right to bully my brother Steve. Like each witness in Rashomon, Jacob is wrongly certain that his perspective is right. Jacob is unable to see the log in his own eye. But in wrestling with God, the night before he was going to see Esau again, Jacob was trying to work it out, wrestling with himself, his beliefs, and his God, removing the log from his eye and laying it all out before God. Jacob is finally ready to meet his brother Esau, submit to Esau, and listen to what he has to say, whatever it may be, including accepting Esau's anger. But when he meets Esau the next morning, Jacob finds that his brother had long since forgiven him. The movie ends with the woodsman finding some redemption from his deceit by agreeing to take a baby, abandoned at the temple, home, to raise with his own children. In both stories, humanity's goodness is ultimately affirmed. So what is in these stories for us, both Rashomon and Jacob's? I offer three things. Don't look for the speck in your neighbor's eye. Be prepared to listen and to learn from the perspective of others, recognizing they may be entirely different than yours, but they are no less valid. We will likely never know a completely objective version of events, but we can grow to respect and appreciate each other. Next, recognize the log in our own eye, our own limitations, failures, and sins, the times we are just wrong. Wrestle with God. Regularly bring our own beliefs before God and each other with a willingness to have them challenged and changed. And finally, Accept God's blessing. Trust that God's grace will meet our failure and provide us the blessing that we all so desperately need and seek. We may be rogues, scoundrels, and ne'er-do-wells, but we are God's rogues, scoundrels, and ne'er-do-wells. Amen.
Please be seated. We've come to the time in our worship when we share the celebrations of our community, lives, and our world. I'll mention aloud new names or updates since the last time that we were together. Invite us to pray over the prayer list. And uh, then I will ask what names, additional names, are on your hearts this day. Some prayers have changed since last time. We celebrate uh, with Mike and El Kowal, who are in Kyrgyzstan, to meet little Zavara, who will, they will be adopting and bringing home. So we look forward to welcoming them uh, when they come home with her. Um, also uh, this morning, um, we celebrate, I'm not going to mention any names, but there are some folks that um, have moved front uh, in, in the, in the, uh, in their seating uh, for the first time in 40 years, have sat in the very back pew and have been proud of this, and for the first time in worship, have, have moved forward. So we won't mention any names. Uh, strength and healing for Stoddard Williams, who has been admitted to the hospital for observation. We've celebrated uh, Stoddard's 93rd birthday uh, last week, the week before. Uh, prayers for Stoddard at this time. For Elaine Meek, who underwent successful heart surgery and is recovering in the hospital, uh, we hold her in prayers for strength and for healing. And we have, uh, over the years, prayed for Ika Scully's sister, Nellie. Uh, she had uh, cancer diagnosis, struggles, and then um, miraculously found, found uh, some, uh, some, some real uh, a plateau with that, some, some real healing with that, and then um, over the last couple of weeks um, has really, really struggled. And so this morning we do grieve Nellie's passing. She died on July 5th. Uh, we pray for Ika. We pray for Ika's family. We pray this morning for Jeff Antonelli and the Antonelli family following the death of Jeff's mother, Sandra. Sandra was an active member of First Church uh, before moving to Illinois. A uh, graveside service for Sandra will be held uh, in the Cincinnati Cemetery this Tuesday. So let's take a moment, if we would, to just read over that prayer list to be in silent prayer as we read those names. And then I'll ask any additional names that are on your hearts today. Additional names that you'd like to call out or places around the world you'd like to mention. Jim. I'd like to introduce to the congregation a good friend from Japan. They're staying here a month. Uh, Ray Yuko and his family. And uh, Ray, 20 years ago, taught at my store. He's my exact same teacher. And I hope one, one of these Sundays, he's here, they're here for a month. One of these Sundays, I hope I can get him up there. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Yeah, great to have you here this morning. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Well, welcome, Nephew James, and uh, congratulations to your grandmother on her 90th birthday. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Joey.
So we, we are all grateful for the turnout and for the impact that it makes, but also grateful for you. We know how excruciating these years have been since you lost Jonathan and grateful that his memory goes on and does something uh, really important for others. So always hope. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, press, press for your son. And, and right, uh, yeah, and, and press too, because I mean, it's just a traumatic thing for him. And uh, so all the details of, of, of all that, sorting all that out with, with banks and things, but also just the emotion of that. And for you, um, I'm curious, did, did he keep his wallet or no? You said his, the wallet came from his grandmother? Um, yes, they did. Oh, they did, okay. Interesting. But yeah. What I was happy was that well, of course. Yeah. 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 Prayers for Paul. Thank you. Well, the Lord be with you. Gracious God, we lift up these prayers, each of them. These prayers spoken aloud, those prayers typed in the comments. We also offer prayers that are too deep for words, that we hold only to ourselves. We trust that you hear them too, that you receive all of our prayers as you receive us with wide open arms. Gracious God, we ask that you be with those who are not seen and heard in this world because of their age or their caste or their race their sexuality, their poverty, their history. Open our ears and eyes to hear and see all people as your people, as your children. And God, be with all children, wherever they live, whoever their parents are, whatever their needs, that they would all be welcomed and nourished and able to be all you want them to be open our hearts and arms to welcome them as well. God of love, be with all who live in fear, fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of being labeled, fear of being themselves, those who live in fear of you. Open us all to your endless love that it might drive out fear. Teacher God, be with us all as we struggle to make sense of your world and your word as your church, in our communities, as your disciples, open our minds and our hearts to learn from you. God of all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, offered from the darkness and hope of our hearts as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Some announcements this Friday, July 21st, community dinner happens monthly here. Um, it will be right here in Palmer Hall from 5 to 6.30. It's a wonderful occasion where members of the church, members from the community come for a free meal. And then there is a uh, charity of choice that is chosen. And um, often someone from that charity speaks. But it's a, it's, it's a time to come together for fellowship and for food. Um, as we've mentioned during these summer months, we're taking a break from children's sermons and regular church school and youth groups um, outside of uh, Vacation Bible School, which has happened, and the mission trip, which is about to happen. Uh, but the nursery is available, um, and that is a place where uh, kids can go as well. And um, so we do, though, encourage that all, all children are always welcome uh, in church. Uh, so you can also register your children now for church school in the fall and for youth groups and for the confirmation program. All that information is on the website. You could speak with me as well. I would love to tell you about it. And then, of course, some of the best ways to meet people in this church to, and is to get involved, develop relationships. Um, you can see many, many volunteer opportunities um, on, on our website. Um, summertime often is more of a, of a kind of downtime when it comes to the ministry programs of the church, but it will not be long till we'll be ramping up again uh, for the fall. We give God thanks for this church, for the many ministry opportunities offered through this church, and let us return that thanks now with our gifts and our offerings.
first, um, Jim, you were an example to us all about inviting people to church. You do that consistently, and um, it's a wonderful example for us. I will note that you invite the very, very best people, and then they leave. You <laughs> <laughs> moved to Florida, and these, yeah, yeah. I had a couple moved to Florida, and these folks are going to go back to Japan. They walk in, and I get all excited, and I think, wow. Fire. 